everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Data Standard Audio Experience. I'm here today with Sasha, Sasha Simoshina, a director of labs at Moving Brands. And today we're going to be speaking about data visualizations in the immersive space. So welcome to the show, Sasha. I'm so excited to have you today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, Catherine. Yeah. And could you just go ahead and tell us more about your background and maybe what led you to where you are today? Yeah, excellent. Um, so I am very much an artist that works in the realm of science. Um, I went to the university university at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, um, where I focused on film, video, and new media. New media being really the thing that transcends a lot of communications, but also video and film as well. Um, so I really wanted to focus on the way that digital technology can interact with helping to educate. And during my time there, I, uh, in I interned at the Field Museum of Natural History, where really this connection between science and art and communication came to be. So I began my internship making animations that were amazing and based on actual data. So we were looking at how Amazonian rainforests were being deforested, and I was able to make animations to make a case to the government of how quickly this was happening. And that was really my first foray into taking actual data and then, you know, translating it into a way that was accessible and visible to, to people and that could make a difference. And so that's really where my love of, of where I am now came to be. Um, I worked in also web design and development when I moved to New York and then in Los Angeles, I had a quick stint working in Hollywood just because I wanted to see what that was like. But truly, um, my path really led me to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I was for six years. And my final kind of title there was uh, Manager of Data Visualization and Infusion. So I really worked with scientists and engineers to try to make their workflow a lot better using new technologies like XR or cross reality to make their processes a lot easier. And I've just finished that job very recently and I'm moving forward to my current title as Director of Labs at Moving Brands, where, you know, Moving Brands is an innovation and sort of, um, you know, design and creative consultant uh, place where not only can design be created and tested, but also kind of thinking of the future of sustainability and accessibility. Labs will really focus on cross-reality, it'll focus on spatial, it'll focus on immersive, how can we take, you know, storytelling? How can we take um, data visualization? How we can we take all of this and make it more accessible, more sustainable? And how can we take it and really make it more part of the educational process for the world as a whole? So that's a huge kind of platform for me, I think, with this. Um, my experience with NASA really led me to seeing how much we could further push technology to even bring it outside of the idea of just what hardware do you have, but how can we really have everyone connected across the world through, through these wonderful new things that are still sort of coming to fruition as we're moving forward in, in, this, in this world. So that's a very quick <laughs> high level view of, of where I am now. Yeah, and that's oh, awesome. That yeah, and that's so awesome to hear um, just kind of how you are in the intersection of being um, the creativity side and data visualizations and technology. Um, it's great to see all of these uh, sides kind of coming together for sure. Yeah, and um, a lot of the work that you do, I'm sure that you have to work with really scaling the data. And so how do you really scale the data that you work with? Well, that's very much dependent on what kind of data we're working with. I think a good example to bring up here um, are sort of two big projects that I focus on at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, one having to deal with Mars data and one having to deal with engineering data. And I can kind of speak quickly to those and how we did think through those things differently. So I should say that the essence of everything that I do now and always, you know, the idea of user experience design and human-centered design is very important. So, you know, really understanding, researching the topic and then, you know, documenting and understanding why certain decisions are being made. Otherwise, you can sort of get lost in software. And I know for a lot of your listeners, you're like, yes, we know this, but I think especially when things are rushed, people sort of forget that side of, of, of the research and and the why and what, what are we making exactly? So then that design and development or engineering can come together and sort of be on the same page about everything. So the Mars project, um, that data, they were very hard to scale, but also easy in a way, because what was happening there was 
we were creating a software called OnSite where you could actually walk on Mars and have conversations together on Mars. So through um, using the HoloLens and um, you know aug augmented reality. So what we had to do there is actually take real data from the Curiosity Mars rover that is currently um, on Mars, the one that was previous to Perseverance, which is currently the newest rover on Mars, um, and also giving us data in a similar way. So very interested to see what J JPL does with that um, as time goes on. But there were constrained data points, right? So we have photos and then we have topographic data. And what we did was we built a pipeline that allowed the photographs to be mixed with the data and then you could actually see, you know, a scalable Mars and be able to walk around it. That's a very, very quick sort of um, oversimplification of what happened. But that, the constraints on those points, as you can see, made it a little easier to understand what we needed to be doing. Um, also, we only had certain data points in terms of where Curiosity is taking photos, although the rover has now imaged so much of Mars, but we still had a limited amount of data to work with. Um, with a project on the engineering side that I led there called Protospace, we were actually taking 3D CAD models and visualizing them in full scale. So really being able to virtually build a model before you built any, machined any part of the system. Again, constrained, but the problem there is the constraints are constantly changing. So as a CAD model changes, um, for those of you that don't know, CAD stands for Computer Aided Design Model, um, and it's used in a lot of complex engineering uh, workflows. I would say most all of them. Um, and so that's the issue there, is if something is constantly changing, you have to make sure that the software that you're creating, again, this is an augmented reality product that you're able to visualize things collaboratively um, at the same time in the same place or in different places, similar to on-site. Um, but with those data points changing and mechanical engineers being like, oh, we've completely redesigned the subsystem and then we kind of had to go manually in and change certain things. That ever changing thing um, was something that was very hard to solve for. And we did not do that quite yet. I'm sure the team is still working on it. Um, and we'll, we'll succeed, but that sort of, that sticking point of the data points that do constantly change and how do you translate that into um, a software using a new technology. Um, there are several great kind of, um, I think, uh, conclusions that I've seen other places come to and other software come to, but that was really an interesting problem to solve that we hadn't fully solved yet. So. It gives you an example of the sort of data sets that I had been working with. Yeah, absolutely. And it's clear that for projects like that, there's a lot of different things that you need to think about and a lot of different people you need to work with in order to accomplish the goals that you have for that project. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And yeah, with a lot of the projects that you work on, you're doing a lot of different data visualizations. What are some best practices that you've used often to really create a story and be able to tell that story? I think it's very important to, again, I'm gonna kind of repeat what I said a little bit, is to really talk and have conversations with the um, the person that's asking you for, uh, for the project or for the person that you're trying to use as an example of, you know, in my case, often, how do you make things more accessible and better? Um, also, thinking within the constraints of having a wide audience, even if things are complex, you want to be able to explain something to someone. And this is challenging, not always showing them exactly what you mean. Like, this is a great, uh, I love podcasts because what I do is so visual and what I am continuing to do is so visual that when I show it, people are like, oh, right explaining it is sort of difficult and it's a little bit kind of like um a little bit out there i think uh, but when you show people or have them go through the experience or even look at it online it becomes a little more clear so i think doing um best practices like this like even trying to explain to a person that maybe isn't in your field what it is you're doing and why you're doing it without having the ability to show them, I think was, of course, we're talking about data visualization, that's hard, but that gets you in the mode of the why and what am I maybe explaining wrong? Do we need this part? It sort of makes those um, conversations and those flows and the storytelling come out very nicely. I think 
coming from the background of working at the Field Museum, because I interned there, but then I worked there um, as a media producer for about over two years when I after I graduated. And that was always the challenge. It was like, we have these data sets that we need to tell stories about. And in terms of data sets, we are talking about deforestation. We're talking about big lumber. We're talking about land that we want to save. But we're also talking about potential um, solutions to that. By and to prove that point, we would be, you know, making sure that that land has, um, you know, having scientists go down and find new species of mammals, uh, look at the kinds of people that were living there, document, 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 and make a case and say, hey, you actually can't do anything to this land. It's sacred. Look at all of these new species of X, Y, Z that live there. Um, but in those conversations, it would be me trying to, you know, tell the story, but then talking to a curator who has a different idea of what they want to do because they want it to work nicely in the exhibit. And then we have the scientist whose work is actually, you know, they have 30 plus sometimes years of work on a certain frog or a certain data point that is very precious to them. And so finding that middle ground through conversation, storytelling, and then also mapping it out. Why? What is the, what is the sort of flow that you want? How does this make sense? And can we all agree on the final outcome? And so I think with those little baby steps of even either saying out loud, mapping it out, you know, I love using Figma a lot to kind of fully, as I'm talking to whether it be, you know, a client, potential client, a friend, whoever, to kind of be able to like, Fig, Fig Jam has been a great new, um, uh, new new source in Figma where you can actually live sort of mind map and do things and uh, kind of come to a conclusion. So I think those beginning parts then make everything else so much, you know, so much easier. So almost I've always kind of taken my background in film and video where you do have to be pretty diligent in how you're mapping out what you're filming, um, taking that and putting it into the realm of database and putting it into the realm of, of software design and development. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear your different experiences that you've had here. And are there any specific projects that maybe were your favorite that you've um, been able to work on that involved elaborate data visualizations? I would say, let me think. I mean, there are so many projects that I love to work on that actually never saw the light of day. And I think in a lot of ways, those were my favorites because they're still able to be created. Um, but I shouldn't speak to those since people can't easily find them. I, so I think one project that I've been really proud of um, has been Reach Across the Stars, which is something that I did independently um, with a colleague and friend, um, Kim Arcand, who works at Chandra's X-ray Observatory. And we sort of met very organically. Uh, she came to JPL, I gave her one of my famous tours. Um, and we began to really understand that we had a middle ground that we loved. Um, she very much studies exploded stars. She's an astrophysicist. Um, you know, she has a, a PhD. She's she's brilliant. She's all, she has a bunch of research, but she was having trouble kind of explaining some of this research to people. So she started making 3D models of the exploded stars, and then that came to VR. And we both sort of had a lot of commonalities in our interests and. As we were working together, we found that there was kind of a lack of background, especially right now, about um, people that are maybe under, you know, people that haven't been recognized in history for what they've done. A lot of those people have been female identifying folks, um, so both women and non-binary folks and trans folks. And we decided to kind of document who we could um, through research and, and create an AR app, called, AR app called Reach Across the Stars. Kim and myself worked alongside uh, Mandy Mandelstein, who is a filmmaker and technologist to work to kind of develop the app. And then um, Kristen Devona, who is kind of the head designer and created all the illustrations and things. So the four of us, all women, created this AR app. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily there is a lot of, there is data visualization in certain ways. So um, really you're looking at a universe of stars, uh, which are different stories of women. And some of those women, um, or female identifying folks, you can actually dive into their story further and even go into an experience and kind of see what they do on the day to day. So 
this was a really interesting experiment because and project because we not only had to think of the stories of uh, of the people that we were working with, but also um, kind of look at their work and see what would work best in a data visualization experience that would then be something that a nine-year-old to a 90-year-old would be engaged with. Um, it was very much, you know, a project that is still in the works. That's the idea is it's not finished right now. Um, the reason we even got to work on it, you know, when Kim came to me and said, let's do this thing, um, the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative called Because of Her Story, um, we actually got the grant to be able to do that through them. And so um, it was a really wonderful project that still continues. And uh, one thing that's great about it too, is we do get feedback from the audience and, and the people and the users that are there and say, hey, it would be really nice, much nice, like this is cool, but it'd be best if you could do this or that. And that kind of evolving, um, because I think software, you know, an AR app is the same as a website. It, it can continue to evolve. It can continue to be better. So it's been a thrill to sort of see the um, feedback from from the people that are interacting with it. But also, I feel proud that we were able to tell some of these stories, um, even if some of them are just a story and we don't have an AR component to them yet, to be able to sort of open the eyes of the next generation and say, hey, these are some of the people that really did not only, you know, be the founders of certain technologies and sciences and engineering practices, but there are new people too now, um, specifically, you know, women that you might not hear about because their work isn't as well published, but they will be the next sort of generation of, of these bigger names. And so hopefully that, that helps to start a larger movement and you know change some of the history books where we can involve um, some of the people that we've included in the app. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a very great way to make everybody feel inclusive as well. So um, great, great project that you were able to work on there. And my final question for you is just really what was your favorite part or what is your favorite part about your role or anything that you've really done in general? I think that my favorite part of my whole career and when I sort of began to participate in speaking engagements and sort of telling people that it's possible to have an interest in art like I did and then work in a more technical field uh, to build the confidence of people that don't think that they can do something like this. I, I do think it takes a lot of extra work and especially as a woman, I do feel like it's been a lot more difficult. It's a lot more difficult, I think, sometimes to say, hey, I'm technologically savvy um, and still to this day. Uh, I've gotten definitely a great attitude about it now and I sort of welcome the challenges of people saying, well, you don't look like you do that. And I'm like, okay, great, why would you say that? And, and that's an interesting conversation. And it doesn't come from me from a place of anger or you know, lack of self-confidence. I, I just like to change, like flip the script a little bit. And so through speaking engagements and through especially connecting with our next generation of explorers, of, 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 of kids especially, I mean, I do a career, um, a career day every year here at um, elementary school called Memes Elementary. And I gotta say, third graders, um, they ask you the most difficult questions you're ever gonna hear. I mean, I've, I've, I've done talks where I, you know, I've been with people that all have PhDs and like none of the questions are as difficult as a third grader asking you something. Um, and then also the rapport that you can have with, with students especially, um, and students like women especially that want to sort of go into more of a software field. I mean, one of my first talks I did in Chicago, um, it was for the Aparicio Foundation. It was just, you know, a talk with a bunch of different girls that were interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as art. Um, so really steam as that, as that goes. Um, and one of the women came up, one of the girls came up to me and she said, you know, you're so confident and you come off as so confident. How did you, you know, you said that you had gotten sometimes in through conversations by just walking up and asking someone something and saying, and, and saying what you're interested in. And I looked at her and I was like, well, you're just, you're doing this right now with me. And she was like, oh, and I was like, yes. Yeah you can do it and it was just I was like I was shocked she was shocked we're like hugging 
Um, just because it was such a beautiful moment where she realized, she said, oh wow, Sasha can do these things, but then she came up to me and did the exact same thing. So it's moments like that, um, and also sort of through my, through my path and continuously now, as I venture into this new chapter with moving brands, I am excited to continue that side of not only my personal story and how it ties into the larger world, but also how we can use technology to sort of tie everything together. Um, I won't be able to scratch the surface of any of the large questions, but it will be really exciting to try and solve some of those, some of those larger issues and, and continue to try and educate and talk as much as I can, as well as learn from everyone that, that I, I have the pleasure of, of interacting with. Yeah, and I think it's great that you're really encouraging and pushing the next generation of especially uh, women in STEM to go into STEM and these creative fields. Um, it's always great to have a mentor from just the past people I've had on the podcast. They've talked a lot about that. And it's great that you're really uh, just kind of giving a lending helping hand to the next generation. And uh, Sasha, I wanted to say thank you so much for being on the Data Standard podcast today with me. Um, it was so great to have you. And where can everyone find you online to connect? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm at Cloud Sasha, C L O U D S A S H A, on Instagram and Twitter. I I am very I'm happy to answer DMs all the time. So if you have any questions or want more resources, I'm happy to send those to you. And then on LinkedIn, you can find me at Sasha Samoshina, um, S A M O C H I N A, um, and. Uh, Again, connect with me if you have questions about internships or pathways of, of what you'd like to do. I'm happy to lend a helping hand and however I can to, to point you in the direction that you'd like to go. Okay, perfect. And to our audience, for more information on the data standard, you can find us at our website and LinkedIn and YouTube channel. And thank you so much, Sasha, for, for joining me today. It was so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been amazing. Uh -huh.